let's do this. Warning, the following awesome presentation contains slides with flashing images for storytelling purposes. Any events described may or may not be fictional. Hey, you must be new to this co-working space. Let me introduce myself via the form of a musical number. <clears throat> I'm just Ozzy, engineer in skill 610. Is it my life to write YAML again and again and again and again? So I work for Big Corp and I'm kind of a big deal as, and I'm sure you already knew that. Uh, big Corp sent me to OSS uh, last year and if you're wondering what that smell is, well, I haven't washed this t-shirt uh, since I went. Um, that's mainly because there haven't been any security incidents and I think this is kind of like good luck, but that's not the smell. It must be my lunch. Um, I've been microwaving some fish in the co-working space and I get so many compliments like, Ozzy, are you microwaving fish again? And that smell lasts for days, but <laughs> no. But I know you haven't asked, but have a look at my cluster. This is Ozzy's production cluster. Uh, we already have Big Corp running their workloads and I don't know what everyone's going on about. Kubernetes isn't that hard, really. Um, right, on that basis, I'm gonna go and talk to management because I deserve a huge promotion. You just wait here and I'll find my phone. Which might be in here. Hey, 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 hey. Jeez. I'm, I'm so sorry to trouble you. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. I'm Nova. I'm here in this co-working space today, too. And uh, I'm really sick of that Aussie guy who's walking around here like he owns the place. He needs to be brought down a peg or two, am I right? And I think I'm the one to do the job. So I look pretty friendly, and I really am deeply kind. Like, for example, I buy my friends lavish birthday gifts. With money I make stealing from people who are co-working spaces like this one, <laughs> people really should be more careful. So basically, I hang out here, I pretend to work, but I'm watching people. And sometimes I see someone who gets a bit excited and leaves their desk with their computer unlocked. So, I have this tool called a rubber ducky. It looks like an innocent USB drive, but to the computer, it's a keyboard typing at superhuman speeds. So I'm gonna put it here in Ozzy's computer, and I'm gonna cause some trouble. So I'll tell you more about exactly what the rubber ducky is doing a little bit later. But meanwhile, I'm gonna do something to mess with them in the short term. So I'm gonna apply YAML to run my own workload on his cluster, and then I'm gonna take away his cluster admin RBAC. RBAC is role-based access control. I'm taking away his cluster admin RBAC status so he can't easily stop my running application. So now I'm gonna pull up my app in his browser. Okay, great, now I'm gonna lock his computer. Oh my God, this is his lock screen? <laughs> All right, yeah, management said they're busy doing something right now, so they're gonna call me back later. All right, Nova rules, Aussie drools. Uh, first of all, that's not true. The pillow was already wet before I went to sleep, and why is that URL pointing at Big Corp? And Nova has somehow accessed my new cluster. Well, I know Nova, or well, no of them. Uh, some fool got pwned uh, by Nova the other day. It was a talk of a co-working space. Uh, apparently, Nova got some photos of them and, trans and they had to transfer Bitcoin money to Nova uh, to make sure that she didn't, well, share them. Um, there was an investigation here to find out who Nova was, but no one could find anyone wearing a dark hoodie with an anonymous mask. So um, I have to hurry up and delete the site before anyone sees it. And I'm getting an error. I, I can't delete their workloads. Um, the error looks like my RBAC's changed. Well, that's super weird. I gave myself most privilege so that I could run this cluster. What's changed? Um, luckily, I have an offline file uh, for my cluster admin um, and a USB key that I keep in a, in a wallet along with a photo of myself. So let's plug that in and switch for kubeconfig file. Great, I have cluster admin access again by using the admin profile and I'll use okay. this profile now to make changes to the cluster to harden it. And hardening is where we make our Kubernetes cluster more secure, making it harder for people to attack. Um, I should be careful about managing this admin account though. Um, we might need to access this in a break glass emergency. So we could use the secrets manager to store this securely, but equally having this offline in a literal safe, making it physically secure could also be a good option. So I'm still using the admin account and I'm able to remove Nova's website, if, but if Nova has his sights on me, well, I better try harder. 
So let's update my RBAC. So instead of having most privilege, I have least privilege when I connect to the cluster with my ASI account, enough to do the work that I'm supposed to do and nothing more. But thinking about it, my API shouldn't be available to everyone on the public internet. We already have strong security in place to ensure uh, who can access the internal networks of our cluster via our cloud provider. So using my cloud provider, I'll put the Cube API onto a private network so randoms can no longer access it, but people in Big Corp can. But how do I manage what's running in my cluster then? Well, um, I heard about this thing called GitOps. I can put all my YAML into a Git repo, and then I can use GitOps to monitor that repo for any changes to the cluster configuration. I learned about GitOps tools like Argo CD, Flux, and Carvel Cap Controller that can help me achieve this. But then the GitOps tool will be the one to interact with a Cube API to deploy all of the company's workloads. And this all happens within the private network. But how does that help you? Well, instead of having a cluster, having a configuration sent in, the cluster can go out and check a Git repo. Instead of giving a key to my cluster and sending it out into the world, I can use GitOps tools uh, to access a Git repo and then update the cluster via the Cube API. Then I just need to secure the Git repo. Instead of a Cube API being the threat boundary, it then becomes a Git repo. I wonder what's going on over there. I've been watching my big corp website in my browser, and I can see he's taken it down. Oh, well. So remember I used that innocent looking rubber ducky hot plug to interact with Ozzy's computer? Let me tell you what I did exactly. First, I made a copy of his cube config file. So now I know the IP address of that cluster he made and he won't stop talking about. I also got Ozzy's private SSH key. Now I have his identity. <laughs> He's so screwed. Also, I got his SSH config file, so I know where Ozzy's private SSH key can be used. And I took the Git config files, and that shows me all the URLs to all the Git repositories that Ozzy's contributed to lately. So with this information, I can and I will cause some real trouble by making Git commits as Ozzy. <laughs> Nice. Uh, the CFO is calling me. Uh, luckily, no one saw Nova's page, otherwise I wouldn't be taking a call right now about my promotion. So yes, yeah, Sazi speaking. Yeah, yeah, no, no, what? No, that must be, mis I'll look into it now, yeah. Right, the call wasn't about promotion. Um, apparently, BigCorp is losing money on each sale on the website. Instead of selling our product for $100, we're currently selling it around $15. But I linked um, our sales to a spreadsheet for the finance team to check, so let's have a look at that. So yeah, I see instead of making around $100 per sale, everything is $13. What kind of idiotic, rookie, liability coworker of mine changed the price of our product? <laughs> Let me check the Git commits for the payment service, and it was me, cool. But I didn't change that code. I've been here all this time, and you've seen that. So here's the commit code that sets the, identity, uh, sets the value to $13, so someone must have my identity. So let me just revert that git commit, if I could only remember how to revert a git commit. Um, <laughs> right, that looks okay. I think that's worked, right? Nope. Wait, someone just committed with me again, and the price is back to $13. How did I set up my git account? Um, I made sure I was secure and used a private key that's only on this machine. A private key is better than a password, but now someone else, <laughs> someone's got access to my private key. Okay, I guess if I revoke my SSH key to stop any further attempts. Right, now let's revert that commit. But this time I'm gonna sign this commit with git sign and I'll talk about that in a bit. But now let's just check the git log and we're looking good. So another way to sign commits is by using a GPG key. So that provi provides a way for me to manage and rotate keys. And I can store that on a YubiKey rather than having it on my laptop. But this time I used a tool called git sign which provides a certificate to sign a git commit that and and I verify myself with OAuth, and this is stored on SIGStore so that the commit can be verified against my identity. So now let's check the spreadsheet, and we're back to $100, and we're okay again. But this shows how important Git is to us. It's not just my Git commits, but access to Git in general. If someone has my password, they could add a random key and commit as me again. So I've also set up multi-factor authentication. That way, to gain access to the repo, people would have to know my username, password, and have access to my MFA device. Wait, what? Back to me already? Ha, <laughs> Ozzy wishes. I'm three steps ahead. Ozzy's about to notice that his cluster is running some unknown container image for his message queue. 
instead of the company approved one. Why is my cluster running some unknown container image for the message queue instead of the company approved one? <laughs> <laughs> That's weird. Our messaging seems to be working just fine and there have been no health status alerts. This is, must have been from another commit earlier on. It looks like an image is being pulled from an unknown registry off the internet. Like, we pull our, all our images from a registry we own inside of our network. Why would we pull a random image? Let's describe a message queue and looks like the image is Nova Images generic message queue app. Like, let's see what this message queue container is running and I can see that data is being sent to uh, an IP address. If that's not a BitCorp IP address. Like, um, Nova's nefarious message queue app is also sending information outside of a cluster. This can't be good. Why would it need to send information out to the internet? So I'll use Kubernetes uh, network policies to ensure that the message queue doesn't have egress access. The message queue app should only be taking requests from our website app and passing it to our database app inside the cluster. There is no reason that any part of this message queue should be sending data out of a cluster. So while Ozzy's been distracted with prank websites and his product price is changing, I've been doing my real money-making attacks. This whole time, the company message queue has been running my container image, my application, instead of the company message queue app. And because of that, I'm able to capture all of the information that's being moved through the company message queue. And I am going to sell it for big money. Oh, but wait, the information stopped being sent. Ugh, Ozzy must have put a Kubernetes network policy in place. As much as I hate to admit it, Ozzy's starting to get better at Kubernetes security. Lucky for me, Ozzy didn't notice that other container I put into his cluster. I still have one more big trick up my sleeve. Right, let's fix the message queue and I'll restore the big core message queue by reverting the git commit that changed it to run Nova's application. And I've already set up networking policies and I've clearly defined which apps in the system are allowed egress access not the message queue app. But I can do better than that. Let's take a step back and look at our cluster again. Our cluster is an open network once inside the cluster. What if someone is inside our cluster? Could they intercept network calls between parts? It'd be good to have encryption set up here, like how HTTPS is used to prevent person in the middle attacks within a co-working space. My cluster is like a co-working space for our apps. What happens if one of the apps starts intercepting the network uh, requests? I'll add a service mesh like Istio, LinkedD, Kuma, or Cilium. A service mesh is used to set up the network inside of a cluster, and it has some additional features that we didn't have before. We can encrypt all traffic between pods so that the internal traffic can get intercepted. Um, this is what people call mutual TLS. And as a side note, a service mesh can also offer identity between services, automatic certificate management, fine-grained network policies, and observability. But what about our workloads coming into the cluster? If someone can access a Cube API, they can apply whatever YAML they like, then our cluster will run it just like what Nova did. So let's see about using a cluster level policy tool like Kivono or OPA to put an emission controller in place to make sure our workloads meet our requirements. Then we'll add a rule that any image in the cluster must come from BigCorp's internal registry. This prevents unknown images being run in the cluster. Wait, the policy just, I just added, notify me that there's a problem. The policy fails for another image being used and it's coming from, uh, the image is coming from outside BigCorp, but what's failing? It's Nova Images generic build app. Oh, it's Nova again. So when I was still able to commit as Ozzy into Ozzy's Git repo, so back before he set up multi-factor authentication, I started running my own container that was disguised to look like Ozzy's company's build service. So it's a common rookie mistake that orgs make to gild, give their build services extra privileges. And it's a mistake that I now intend to exploit. Ozzy isolated his build service in the CICD namespace of his cluster. Here, let me show you. Here's the build service in the CICD namespace. Ozzy put measures in place to isolate that CICD namespace from others, thinking that will protect him from attack. So from that privileged running build service container, I will use a tool called nsenter to connect to a different Linux namespace on the host machine. And now I connect to the host process on the node and that gives me a little more privilege to gain access 
to the entire machine as roots, and now I can see everything on the entire machine. <laughs> right, back to Nova's images on the build up. Wait, 1337, that's a hacker term for elite, as an elite. Like, Nova's make me look a right noob right now. So let's look at what's being run. Um, not only is Nova running an unknown image, Nova has given a number of privileges to that container, including a process namespace of a host machine. Thinking about it, if you run a container with privileges, I'm pretty sure you'd be able to move laterally onto the machine running the containers. And if that's the case, I'm not in a great position right now. So let's update our runtime policies to pre prevent this kind of profile from being used nefariously. Now, using a runtime security tool with eBPF, like Falco or Cubarmer, I can monitor all communications happening on the kernel and enforce runtime policies that I create. eBPF is a technology that allows code to run in the Linux kernel without changing uh, kernel source code or loading kernel modules. It gives us a lot of power, but as we all know, with great power comes... Great responsibility. Thank you. Yeah. And the kernel is outside of a Kubernetes cluster, but I could track what's going inside a cluster at a kernel level. And it's not just a cluster, it would be everything on the machine. So here I am, I have access to this whole machine in Aussie's cluster as root. Let's see if I can listen in on any of the traffic going across the network. Hmm, the traffic's all encrypted, drat. Aussie must have preemptively added service mesh. Dang, he's getting good. With eBPF, I can track what's going on in Aussie's cluster at the kernel level. And it's not just Aussie's Kubernetes cluster, it's everything on Aussie's entire machine. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna use this eBPF-based tool called BoopKit, which, as a side note, BoopKit was created by Chris Nova, a cloud-native security researcher, wonderful human, and friend. She inspired my name, but she used her hacking skills for good and not for evil like me. So right, I'm gonna use BoopKit so that I can manipulate Ozzy's running kernel. The first thing I will do is to create a back door so I can get back here easily without having to break out of a container again. Next, I wanna use BoopKit to see the system calls on Ozzy's Kubernetes node. Perhaps there's some data here I could sell or hold for ransom. Uh, but Ozzy's getting good at this security stuff, so I'm gonna go old school and leave a calling card. A fork bomb. So if I lose access to this cluster, this process will get started and Big Corp will pay. A fork bomb is a bash function that gets executed recursively. So it's a denial of service attack where a process continuously replicates itself and crashes the system. This is what you get for microwaving fish, Ozzy. Uh, what, it didn't work? Oh no. I just lost access to the cluster. I didn't have enough time to set up my fork bomb. No! Oh! Oh! No, no, no! Oh! I'm, it looks like I'm completely shut out. Dang it. Okay, so here's what happened. <laughs> I looked at Falco onto the node, but noticed that something didn't look right, and it felt like someone was already there and looking to modify something. So I alerted Big Corp Security and we put plans together to quarantine the cluster. The, en the engineering team provisioned a new cluster at the same time. So this new cluster is built with everything we've learned over the last 20 minutes. We've now directed all customer traffic to the new cluster and we can use forensics on the old cluster to figure out how far Nova got. Best part is we have a brand new cluster with hardened security. Ooh, may I tell them about the security features of the new cluster? How do you know about the security features on my new cluster? <laughs> Don't worry about that. Yeah. All right, so first of all, the Cube API isn't public. It can only be accessed from within BigCorp. Mm -hmm. Then Ozzy added least privilege RBAC. So we have one heavily guarded privileged account only to be used in emergency scenarios and regular users have view only access. Maybe you're asking yourself, if regular users can only view it, how are they able to make any changes? And that is with GitOps. So the GitOps tool is the thing that's interacting with the Cube API, which moves the threat boundary out to the Git repo. So instead of um, a user or a tool reaching into the cluster to use Cube API, the GitOps tool is reaching outside of the cluster. Then since GitOps is the new threat boundary, we have our Git repo secured with multi-factor authentication. 
And then Ozzy added Kubernetes network policies. Ozzy added that specifically to prevent any application from reaching outside of the cluster that shouldn't be able to send information out of the cluster. But you can use Kubernetes network policies for all sorts of, uh, all sorts of things to restrict all sorts of access. Then we talked about service mesh and mutual authentication. So this authenticates applications to one another and it encrypts network traffic. Then we talked about cluster level policy like OPA or Kyberno. Those are the tools you'd use to add that. This is often organization specific and it's at the cube API le level. So Ozzy in a story, he made a policy that prevents images from being run that come from any registry other than the big corp internal registry. And then finally, Ozzy added runtime security with a tool like Falco or Cube Armor. So this is monitoring at the kernel level um, system calls that are happening and making policy around what's allowed to happen there. Yep, that's pretty much it. <laughs> so uh, this was my cluster at the beginning. Looking back on it, it's not necessarily my proudest moment, but equally, I didn't know uh, 20 minutes ago what I do now. This is closer to uh, what a hardened cluster should look like. And although there is always room for improvement, <laughs> I know this looks intense, but when we break it down, it all makes sense. So I finally understand what they mean by onion layer security. It's not about having a single layer and peeling that layer and crying myself off to sleep each night. It's about having security in depth, having lots of layers of security to prevent lots of different attacks. So thank you. I'm, my name's not really Ozzy. My name's Lewis Ellen Parry. You may remember me from such talks as this one. And when I'm not being overly dramatic, I work at a company called ChainGuard. So at ChainGuard, we offer secure container images. So instead of shifting left, we're starting left. And it is my distinct pleasure to introduce you to the star of the show, the amazing uh, creative mind who put all our slides and together um, from the ideas that we had. Thank you. My name is Whitney Lee. You can find me places like the internet. Uh, uh, I work at VMware Tanzu. I host a lot of streaming shows. My favorite one is You Choose on the DevOps Toolkit YouTube channel. And we also have stickers to give away. So if you see us or you want to come up, they're, they're fish in a microwave sticker. So come up and have, take one. And I believe that's it. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. We did it. <laughs>